Hello everyone and welcome to a new section of Gravity Class. Today's speaker is Bastian Diaz. Bastian obtained his master and PhD from Universidad Tecnica Federico Santa Maria under the supervision of Professor Alfonso Cervec. <clears throat> Then he held a postdoctoral position at TUM in Germany, working in the group of Alejandro Ibarra. And currently, Bastian is working as a postdoc in the group of Paola Arias and Universidad de Santiago de Chile. Bastian is interested in physics beyond the standard model and specifically in dark matter phenomenology. So I would like to invite Bastian now to tell us all about thermal and bouncing dark matter. So Bastian, please. Okay, thank you for the presentation and organization of these uh, regular meetings, uh, Sebastian, and the other organizers, of course. Um, Yes, I'm doing my postdoc at University of Santiago, and I'm going to present you about this uh, topic of dark matter. So if you have any question or comment, uh, please interrupt me at any moment. The outline is very simple. We are, I'm going to uh, introduce a little introduction to the field. Then uh, I'm going to take some uh, basic tools Uh, or we are going to review some basic tools from cosmology and thermodynamics uh, as elementary tools to understand the dynamics of, uh, of the hypothesis of thermal dark matter in the early universe. Then uh, we are going to move to our model that we are working with a, a doctoral student, uh, Patricio, sorry, I, I didn't said that, uh, Patricio Scalona. He's a PhD student here in Santa Maria uh, University in Valparaíso. Um, so I'm going to show you the model that we are working on. Um, in particular, I'm going to show you this, uh, this effect that is called bouncing uh, of one uh, dark matter component and then the conclusions. So as all you know, um, there is a uh, strong evidence in the in the from observations uh, from the astrophysical side that uh, the normal matter is not unique um, there is another component which uh, it's called dark matter that compose something like 26% of the total energy density of the universe um, as you can see in the cake in the right and uh, this uh, this cake is based uh, on Or the evidence that we have is uh, typically from the uh, rotation curves, uh, ballet clusters, and uh, CMP uh, physics. Um, of course, the, the possibilities of dark matter are pretty much uh, high. Um, you have um, uh, orders, too many, a lot of orders of magnitude in for the mass of these. Uh, of this hypothetical uh, particle or, or, or even beyond particle, you can have other kinds of things like primordial black holes, as you see in, in yellow, uh, with very, uh, very massive objects. And um, you have the axions um, or axion-like particles as the ultralight dark matter. Um, and in this work, I'm going to focus uh, on the WIMP WIMP region, which is this blue one, uh, in which you treat uh, the dark matter uh, with um, values for its mass in, in this uh, mass range, as you can see. So let me go um, with the cosmology first, um, the basic tools. So this is, of, of course, a very simplified uh, description um, just uh, I'm going just to highlight the the main things that uh, are uh, important to describe the the physics in the early universe so um, as you know the cosmology we describe the cosmology with this metric uh, the Friedman Robertson Walker metric with a being the scale factor which describes the size of the universe K okay, here is a spatial curvature And we define uh, this Hubble parameter uh, uh, as the um, change of this scale factor. Um, 
and also uh, you usually heard about this uh, Hubble constant, which is uh, the Hubble parameter uh, today, basically. Um, for those interested in, in cosmology, uh, I recommend you to look at the Hubble tension, which is uh, there is a tension about regarding this the value of this uh, h zero. Um, from Einstein's equations, you can get this uh, Friedman equation, which describes the, the expansion of the universe in the left uh, with respect, um, according to the energy densities that you have in the, in the universe, uh, considering different species. And also you can have, you have here the, the, uh, the curvature, uh, spatial curvature. So for instance, uh, when you turn uh, this curvature parameter off, uh, you can write down what is called the critical density uh, given by this uh, expression, just uh, um, from here, from this equation, you can get uh, this uh, row evaluating the Hubble rate at, uh, at, uh, today, considering a spatial curvature equal to zero. And why this is uh, useful? Because um, normally all the um, observations that we, uh, the cosmological observations that we uh, we deal with are based on this, what uh, is called the parameter densities. And then for instance, for dark matter, um, but all the parameter densities are in the same way. So it's the, is the quotient between the density of the species, in this case, the dark matter measured today over the, this critical density. And today uh, measurements um, tell us uh, that this value is 0 0.12. So um, uh, at the same time, um, uh, from the general relativity uh, in the context of cosmology, you have that the conservation of the uh, energy tensor, the tensor of uh, energy momentum um, implies uh, this equation for the, uh, for the densities in which here you have uh, some parameter um, in the equation of a state that relates the density of some species with its uh, pressure. If you solve this equation, you, you can get uh, relationship between the density of some species, species um, and the, the size of the universe or uh, yeah, the, 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 the relationship between the density and the scale factor. So these uh, values for W are, um, are known from uh, uh, statistical mechanics. And for instance, when you have matter, um, non-relativistic uh, particles uh, at some temperature, you can uh, obtain uh, the, this um, relationship of uh, rho and, and the scale factor, this dependence. And this is useful in order to, um, if you plug in these solutions into the Friedman equation that I show you, uh, you can get the, um, the dependence of the, your scale factor with uh, with time, for instance. In this case, for if you consider a radiation um, dominated universe in six, you can see that uh, here we have the Hubble parameter, and you replace just uh, what you have found from this equation. So this a to the minus three, sorry, uh, sorry, a to the minus four here. And you can solve easily this, uh, uh, this equation, founding this uh, relation, uh, scale factor and the uh, time. And also you can find the Hubble rate or even the relation between the, between the uh, really, uh, sorry, the density of the radiation and the, and time. And um, why this is useful? Uh, because you can describe uh, the, the the epochs of uh, of our universe, and here you can see three species. We say density, uh, sorry, radiation, matter, and uh, uh, dark energy in, in these three colors. And as we have that, they depend differently. Um, 
uh, the density of each each of them depend uh, differently in the the powers of the scale factor in the um, in the solution of your uh, um, from your um, sorry from your Friedman equation you get different uh, domination of each one so in the early universe you expect that the radiation was dominating the the, the density so it was uh, the the engine let's say of the Hubble of, of the expansion of the universe uh, at some point you have the matter and nowadays we have that dark energy is dominating the the density and here in the in the right you see a timeline for the different epochs uh, different uh, events that we expect to have occurred in the universe and in particular here i uh, i'm highlighting uh, the when you expect that dark matter uh, was originated of course this is based on certain assumptions uh, you can uh, due to the plethora of uh, possibilities, uh, you can have the production of your dark matter in, in different, at different epochs. But normally, or what I'm going to focus on is that the dark matter uh, produced in um, thermal dark matter based on the freeze out uh, mechanism, we expect that dark matter was produced at this epoch, uh, this type, uh, at this temperature, but it's not as strictly at this exactly this epoch, but it can be, for instance, at higher um, temperatures um, above, for instance, the QCD phase transition. This is just a, a reference. So these are the elements of um, of cosmology um, that we are going to uh, to deal with. So. Uh, is there any question so far? So if you have any question, please interrupt me. I'm going to uh, thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, um, as you all you know, um, we define the thermal equilibrium. Uh, well, here dif we differentiate between uh, some uh, uh, some. Uh, yeah, the equilibrium takes different uh, meanings um, in the early universe. So we differentiate between uh, kinetic equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, and the more general word, uh, which is uh, thermal equilibrium. And remember that thermal equilibrium is when you system you have a system with the same temperature. So this is the maximal entropy state, uh, and but now, um, when we talk about kinetic equilibrium, we are referring to um, normally, um, from the microscopical point of view, we we think um, in elastic scatterings. And elastic scatterings, uh, we say that this, the particles are in kinetic equilibrium if they follow the typical distribution functions uh, from Fermi-Dirac or Bose-Einstein that you all you know. Uh, on the other hand, um, chemical equilibrium is related to inelastic scatterings. Or, uh, in analogy to uh, chemical reactions, uh, normally in a chemical reactions, you have the products or reactants uh, different than the products. Um, and in, in that picture is exactly the same here um, due to the quantum uh, quantum behavior of, uh, of particles at high temperature, you have uh, particles uh, appearing and disappearing all the time. Uh, so chemical equilibrium is when you have some type of reactions uh, that um, basically their chemical potentials uh, are, um, follows this, uh, this uh, equation. Um, of course, this can be generalized to have more particles in the initial state or the final state. So remember here just uh, some quantities that are useful in order to describe the abundances of uh, dark matter in, in this case. 
so remember that the number density of particles, this is the number of particles divided by the volume, is the, uh, given by the integral of three momenta of this distribution functions, and the and the energy density given by this uh, by this expression multiplied by the energy, and you can in certain limits you can see that the the values of this uh, number density, for instance, goes like two to this uh, to the cube when you have higher uh, high temperatures temperatures much uh, above the the mass of the particles, but when you have, for instance, temperatures below, you expect uh, below the mass of the particle, you expect this uh, expression in which uh, we have this exponential, which is a suppression in the number of density of the particles. This is called uh, normally the Boltzmann suppression. So um, just a few, a few more things uh, before entering into the into our work. Um, as the temperature is changing in our universe, um, sorry, um, just a moment. My headphones are being discharged. <laughs> just a second. Um, Okay, so temperatures uh, or time and temperature is changing in the early universe and in a radiation dominated universe, we expect this dependence between uh, or this relationship between time and temperature. And the, the number density of of the particles that are interacting and are in, in a, an expanding universe have to, to follow, um, or you have two quantities that compete um, that can basically change your uh, number densities. Uh, one is um, you have the rate interactions among the particles, which is given by this, uh, and one and, and two, the two different uh, number densities multiplied by the cross section uh, times the relative velocity. Of course, here you have a. Um, here uh, we are considering uh, uh, some average because uh, we we are considering a thermal buff in the early universe, and at the same time we have the expansion of the universe. So these two tools enter into one single equation, which is called the Boltzmann equation, which describes the evolution of your uh, distribution function. Um, according to some uh, integral differential equation. So here you have the Liouville operator, uh, which is a differential operator uh, that it, it takes different forms depending on the context. And here you have a collision, collision term uh, that acts on the, on the, um, on the distribution of, of your particles. So for instance, um, of course, uh, there are many details here. I'm just being, um, I'm just describing the the, the most uh, general things, I, I guess. So um, don't worry if you don't understand uh, all, um, all the details. Are um, this is a kind of magic because uh, I'm just putting some uh, results that uh, behind them there are a lot of mathematics and algebra. But uh, just try to follow me in this um, this equation. So uh, it's to describe the uh, the changes of your uh, uh, distribution function, which, as I told you, uh, you having once uh, you have this uh, distribution function, you can get a, a number of densities, uh, the energy densities, pressure, uh, etc. So, for instance, in a Friedman Robertson world universe, uh, you can um, you can describe or the Boltzmann equation takes this uh, this form. Um, and uh, the collision term contains uh, annihilations of particles, for instance, and elastic scatterings. And one way to deal with this uh, is to integrate this equation in um, 
in three momentum, and you and you, you end up with the Boltzmann equation in its more uh, common form in this context, which is this one. So here you can see that in uh, in this equation you have a term that gives you the the change rate of uh, the number density of uh, your dark matter particle. You have here a term that uh, it's uh, related to the, is due to the expansion of the universe. Here you have the Hubble, uh, Hubble parameter, uh, Hubble rate. And here you have in the right side, the interactions. So for instance, uh, here, yeah, and this is the cross section and here N um, chi, this is the equilibrium density, which is given by this expression. So, um, for instance, if we, uh, let's say, um, turn, turn this uh, term off and this term off. So, of course, you get, you get this, uh, the time derivative of your number density equal to zero. It means that your number uh, density is equal to a constant. It means in an expanding universe that the number of particles in a volume is decreasing over uh, as the time goes by. Because you have that, the, uh, remember that you have a volume here, which is, the, is given by the scale factor to the cube. So the number density, if you have, it's a constant, your number of particles in this volume that is, in, is, is growing, um, uh, you expect that the number density decreases. Um, so um, you can, uh, ah, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. This occurs provided, sorry, I, what I've said, uh, this occurred provided the, the Hubble rate is, is, uh, is present, of course, because this uh, is, um, the, the Hubble parameter is proportional to the, to the scale, the derivative, of, uh, time derivative, derivative of the scale factor. So uh, if we turn this parameter off, H, uh, you have a static universe. You are, the scale factor is constant. So the number of particles in that case is constant in a, in a, a constant volume. But now if you, uh, with no interactions, but you have the Hubble expansion, you expect uh, what I've said in the, in the beginning. The, you have a dilution in that sense. So you have a number, uh, um, certain number of particles that um, um, the density, if you want in this uh, co-volume is uh, going to decrease because the universe is, uh, is expanding. And on the other hand, if you include the, um, uh, the interactions now, um, just let me, okay. If you include the interactions now, uh, you can see that you have to solve this system of, equa well, this equation uh, numerically. Um, in particular, you can see uh, in, in, in order to solve this, um, um, typically ones uh, recast this equation in, with new variables. Um, and these typical definitions, in, uh, this capital Y, for instance, uh, which is the number density over the entropy density, is just to get rid of your uh, Hubble rate expansion explicitly. That is explicitly in 15. But if you introduce this, uh, this variable, now you, you get, uh, you, you don't see exactly the Hubble expansion in, the, in your uh, equation. Also, you are uh, you define this parameter x, which is in the inverse of the temperature. Um, okay, yeah, there are too many details here, um, but just uh, get the message here that now this is the equation that will describe your um, abundances of your particles. Uh, assuming that in the, the initial condition for to solve this uh, to solve this equation is um, that in the beginning in the early universe or at uh, temperatures much higher than the mass of your dark matter particle, your particle um, dark matter particle were 
uh, was in thermal equilibrium with uh, the rest of the standard model particles. So in that sense, um, the, the number of dark matter particles were exactly the same. But uh, as temperature uh, decreases or time goes by, you can see that there is an effect and the solution for, sorry, for Y here goes, um, tracks the equilibrium and it goes, uh, it decreases. But at some point you have this, uh, what is called the freeze out. And, and this occurs um, when you have the Hubble rate, uh, the, the, this competition and the Hubble rate being uh, much bigger than the interactions of your of your particles and at some point you have this uh, constant value for the moving um, number density this y so after that you have um, a constant number of dark matter particles until uh, until today actually and um, then so the um, um, the parameter density uh, in this context is uh, given by, you, you, you can get this expression and it turns out that uh, your parameter density of dark matter depends inver inversely uh, with the cross section that was here. So the bigger is the cross section, the lower is your dark matter relic abundance that you, uh, you obtain. And here, um, sorry, I didn't say, but um, they are proportional. Uh, they, this moving number density y uh, is uh, proportional to the parameter density that we measure today, this uh, omega. Um, so yeah, this is the, the mechanism in its most simple, um, in its most, most simple way. Um, is there any question so far before to enter into the into the model? Seems no. Okay. Um, so uh, the um, and. Okay, the model. Um, yeah, I have uh, ten minutes. Um, let me um, explain you the, the the main features of uh, the model that we are exploring. Um, it's a very simple extension to the standard model in which you introduce a Dirac fermion and a complex a scalar S. Here uh, you can decompose the your Dirac fermion in both chiralities. And you can see if uh, you have uh, imposed this chiral approximate uh, global symmetry, each of the fields uh, transform, I'm sorry, you, you assign this, uh, these transformations um, for the fields. So the vector uh, symmetry transform your both chiralities, but the, the scalar transform in a trivial way. Uh, Although, and the axial symmetry you want to uh, transform the or fields in this way. Uh, this has the consequences that your Lagrangian uh, results to be this um, with some interactions, uh, Yukawa like uh, couplings between the new scalar and the, the fermions, the new fermions. And you have a potential a typical potential that um, a kind of Higgs portal here, um, typical terms for for S, and um, also you have you, we introduced by hand uh, this soft breaking term for in order which is this one. Um, it breaks explicitly the the global symmetry, and it was. Uh, in order to generate a um, mass for uh, the this um, one of the components of this uh, of the scalar 
of the complex scalar. So this means uh, when S, the, the field S, get vacuum expectation value, you write down, you can grab, uh, write it uh, in this way in which uh, you have the radial component S and chi, uh, it's the, the angular one. And at lower ener at low energies, after some algebra, you, you can see that uh, the Lagr your Lagrangian is given by this uh, by this, uh, these terms with um, now after this breaking you uh, you get a mass for your fermion in the beginning it was not possible to include a, an explicit mass term for your fermion due to the symmetries of the system now you have a mass for your uh, what is called the um, for your chi which which is the pseudo Goldstone boson, and you have some interactions between the fermions and the the physical radial uh, degrees of freedom, which are the Higgs, and uh, we recognize H1 as the Higgs boson and H2 as a second as a second Higgs, and you have here some parameters that is, um, which um, are related to the Higgs portal. I'm going to show you in in, in a moment uh, the explicit meaning of this. And you have an interaction here between a uh, cell the scalar current for your fermion and your cell the scalar. Plus a potential, uh, which is a, uh, um, it, it has uh, too many terms, uh, but um, one of the interesting things here is that you don't find any term here with even um, with odd uh, powers of your chi field. Um, and it means that when you have this hierarchy uh, between the two uh, new degrees of freedom, um, both particles become stable at three and relative level, then both can be dark matter candidates at the same time. Though uh, both are massive, uh, electrically uh, neutral, and uh, and they connect to the standard model by uh, these two Higgses. So, um, and the parameters are related uh, by, um, there are some, um, these, um, these expressions um, for the parameters are uh, in which you are related, uh, related this uh, mixing angle after diagonalizing the mass matrix uh, of your uh, scalar sector. Um, and this theta is basically uh, how strong is your Higgs portal. You have other parameters, but they can be independent. You, um, here you have the masses of your dark, um, uh, of your uh, Higgs. And at the end, uh, you have these five free parameters of the model, which are three masses, uh, the fermion, the pseudo Goldstone, and, um, and the second Higgs. And two couplings, a Yukawa light coupling, and the Higgs and the Higgs portal. So uh, let's context this model uh, in a thermal context in the early universe, assuming that both particles, psi and chi, as well as um, H two, were in thermal equilibrium with the rest of the particles in the in a radiation dominated universe. In this sense, reactions were occurring at um, at high rates much um, much bigger than the Hubble rate actually and they were uh, thermalized in uh, that is our initial condition so here you have a set of diagrams that uh, show you the interactions between your dark sector in the uh, in general in the left side with the standard model particles and particles into the dark, uh, of the dark sector also in the in the right side, and for instance, um, yeah, there are many diagrams I know, but just uh, take into account, for instance, the third diagram, which you have two um, when you have the time arrow in the in the horizontal place here, uh, you see that you can have two fermions of dark matter annihilating and creating one pseudo Goldstone and for instance, uh, one of the two Higgses. 
or you, you can have, for instance, conversions um, in, of your dark matter particles in which you have two fermions annihilating into two uh, pseudo goldstones or vice versa. And also you have in the third line, for instance, the annihilations of your pseudo goldstones uh, into the standard model particles via the Higgs portal. Um, yeah, this, this type of T channels, uh, T, U and contact for your pseudo goldstones. So the dynamics here, it's not trivial, but, um, but uh, you can describe the abundances uh, or how the system evolves uh, when you consider that they were in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. So when the temperature become uh, close to the masses of the particles, there is not enough energy to create them from the standard model uh, par particle side. So you start to have a, the, what I show you here, a kind of this uh, behavior in which the abundances tend to decrease. Um, yeah, here I'm just showing you um, some terms. They are not all of them, but some terms that describe the evolution of your densities of both components in the system. Um, lambda here is proportional. Uh, it's a term that is proportional to the cross section of the interactions. So uh, we solve these equations. Um, using uh, micromegas, um, a code that deal, can deal with up to two dark matter particles at the same time, like this model. And, and okay, yeah, you have too many things to, to do here. Um, and you can, you, ha as you have uh, five parameters. You can, you, you have a lot of freedom in that sense. Um, but let me just uh, finish with this, uh, with this uh, results that we we have found that in the, as I've said, the the particles, the two dark matter particles, were in thermal equilibrium in the in the beginning, and it means that when the pot, uh, chemical potential, it means that they were in. The, um, their chemical potentials were equally to zero, and and you can track each abundance or or they respect this uh, this relation uh, in that moment before uh, the before the freeze out. I mean, uh, this is a it's an approximation. So when you have uh, the mass of the pseudo boson bigger than the fermion dark matter. Um, from this equation uh, with vanishing chemical potential, you can see that um, the uh, number density of your uh, pseudo goldstone goes like um, an exponential suppression here. Yeah. So you expect that when they are um, at some point before uh, chemical decoupling, you expect that the abundance of your pseudo goldstone boson decreases too fast. Um, but uh, it occurs, or it turns out in this model that uh, at some point, when the particles decouple chemically from the from the standard model sector, you have a non-vanishing. The both particles can uh, get a non-vanishing uh, chemical potential, and it means that this relation it's not uh, longer useful. Uh, but in, you have some modification in which the chemical potentials enter into, into this relation. And now you have an exponential here, which indicates um, a kind of compensate uh, effect to the Boltzmann suppression that you had here. So if this exponential uh, wins to this exponential suppression, you can have an increasing in the in your number density of the pseudo boson. Uh, that is provided that the, the uh, potential, ke the chemical potential of your pseudo boson is bigger than the chemical potential of the uh, of the fermion. The other hierarchy key doesn't present this uh, effect, um, and yes, uh, let me just view this uh, the effects that you 
in the yields, in the commoving number density of each uh, part, dark matter particle. And here you can see that the, as the temperature decreases, uh, in blue you have the, uh, the abundance of the fermion, and in red, this, uh, the pseudo Wollstone abundance. For certain um, values of, of your parameters, the five parameters that I show you. So here you can see clearly this increasing in the abundance of the pseudo Wollstone, and at some point it freezes out. Um, and you see that it it can grow many orders of magnitude actually. And in the right, you see the the evolution of the chemical potentials um, um, as the inverse of the temperature again. So you can see that the, in this in this case uh, the the chemical potential of your pseudo Goldstone it's um, uh, becomes like twice the chemical potential of your dark matter particle. And this was a, a part of the condition that was necessary in order to increase the uh, number density of your of your particle or, or your cell the Goldstone particle. Sorry, Nicolas, do you, do you have a question? Yes, thanks. Uh, so, uh, um, um, Basia, I'm a bit confused. Why can you develop a chemical potential so that's after freeze out, right? I mean, it's uh, after yeah. your, your break can Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, here you can see that the, the particles were in thermal equilibrium in the in, in, in at high temperatures, but when they start to decouple, they start to generate these chemical uh, chemical potential yeah. values in such a way that you uh, you have now um, this exponential um, enhancement or to your number density. In other words, uh, you have in the um, in the Boltzmann equations uh, you have these terms, which are these ones um, that basically, as you can see here, uh, you have a production of um, or, or the annihilation of two fermions into uh, one uh, pseudo scalar plus one Higgs, one of the one of the two Higgses. So you have uh, an increase in, in your Boltzmann equation from this term. But that just yeah. like a semi annihilation, no? So the psi that annihilates into a chi, so that's why it increases. Yeah, exactly. And and of course here you have a logarithmic uh, scale, so. The effect is not too visible uh, in the, the bump is for uh, increasing strongly the abundance of, uh, of the pseudo Golson, but uh, the fermion decreases, but yeah, the, the effect is not too notorious in this sense. And, oh, and, and here, we, um, just we move a little bit the parameters, but I don't have time to enter into more details, but the, the, the main message is this one, that we have found a certain um, certain in certain parameter space of the model, uh, you can have this effect. Of course, this effect is not new. Actually, it's a paper, a recent paper, uh, was showing this effect. It uh, from August, um, and they called this bouncing dark matter. Um, and but they they have exemplified this effect uh, using uh, another. Another model, um, and just uh, to finish, uh, the um, one of the characteristics or the features that we are um, exploring uh, are related to the indirect detection rates. It it turns out that this uh, the this annihilation uh, that occurs in the S wave, which is, it means in uh, Sorry for the technical, too technical, but it's uh, it's necessary to to indicate that this uh, this annihilation today occurs at a velocity. It's not suppressed by the velocity of the non-relativistic particles, the fermions. Um, but this uh, this uh, cross section in this context 
of bouncing dark matter uh, can get very high values, much above uh, the thermal um, the, the thermal typical thermal um, value of your uh, cross section times uh, the relative velocity. Here we have taken um, some values, um, typical values to have this bump, uh, this bouncing of the pseudo scalar, and you can see in blue the the values that we obtain with micromegas for the the cross section of this process, uh, one is the fermion and two is the pseudo scalar and zero is uh, st standard model particles. Um, and the rest of the cross section you can see that are, are below, but it, they are equally uh, sizable in comparison with the, with the thermal uh, canonical uh, cross section. So we expect at some point that this type of effects uh, could be interested to be explored in the indirect detection. And here I just put uh, a flux, for instance, of this, of uh, yeah, bottom anti bottom, or yeah, this traduce, uh, sorry, this translates into the fact that uh, you will, uh, will observe, for instance, the uh, anti protons um, at Earth. Um, but they were born uh, from um, from quarks, for instance. Uh, that and these quarks, in turn, they were originated by the one of the two Higgs bosons, in particular this uh, Higgs second Higgs. Um, but of course, this model um, you you expect some suppression uh, in in this in this flux due to the model dependent. Um, um, yeah, some suppression uh, coming from the from the model, uh, the model itself. So here, for instance, in this expression, you expect uh, uh, the branching that you have here proportional to the flux um, is suppressed by this mixing angle, and this angle has been uh, constrained by LHC searches. Or also, you can have a suppression in the relic abundance of your fermion. Because in the bouncing case, um, you can have um, you, you can have that the, your dark fermion dark matter can be um, in a subleading uh, contribution to the total relic abundance. So you have in certain, of course, in certain parameter space points. Um, so yeah, I, I know that there are too many things here, and I just uh, I I wanted to. Just show you the, you know, in a very general way, what we are doing. Um, so, um, as you have seen, uh, we have been reviewing um, some basics of cosmology and thermodynamics, and you can see that both areas are uh, uh, are necessary uh, to be together in order to describe the dynamics of um, the thermal dark matter in the early universe. Um, we have seen um, a simple uh, model that uh, it was not present in the literature in our knowledge. Um, and we have context this uh, scenario in a two component dark matter. Uh, in two component, uh, we have seen that this model presents in some parameter space uh, two components stables um, being dark matter candidates and presenting at the same time, this uh, bouncing effect of one of the of the dark matter candidates, and also we are uh, getting some results in indirect detection, but they are not exactly uh, finished. Um, but we are in in, in that part, uh, and we hope to to get the, those results uh, soon in order to to upload to archive this in this work. So, thank you. Uh, for listen to me. <laughs> so uh, Sebastian asked me uh, to uh, to talk here in the closing session. So thanks, uh, Bastian, for this very interesting talk. I, I don't know if you or anybody of you have any question.
So, Nicolas, you have your hand raised. Yes. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, Bastian, for the very nice talk. So, I have a question related to previous slide. Could you please go back? Sure. Here. So, it, so that cross section one one two zero. So the the highest cross is the annihilation of which particle? I'm um, sorry. Uh, one refers to the fermion. So two fermions today annihilating into one pseudo goldstone, chi and H two. Okay. So and in that case, what? Which one is the dominant dark matter? The other, right? Yeah, yes, because for instance, um, uh, we have this uh, uh, delta two parameter here that uh, I didn't I, I didn't tell you, uh, but um, it measures it, it the process this annihilation to fermions annihilating into a pseudo goldstone and two Higgs and sorry in a second Higgs is kinematically possible so. Mm -hmm. When you have a delta two bigger than zero, it means that um, you need to decrease H two, uh, or, or the yeah you, you need um, uh, certain masses. But we have found that in 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 that case, uh, normally you have that the the pseudo Gaussian dominates the abundance, so you expect one or yeah, one or two orders of magnitude uh, of suppression in the in the abundance of the fermion. So here, mm -hmm. this is to the square because you have two dark matter annihilating today. So this is an additional suppression ex uh, normally expect. Yeah. Okay. So maybe the for the indirect detection, the prospects are not that good. Because you say you yeah. have a big cross section, but we have big suppression also, big this ratio square, and also the branching ratio. Yeah, hmm. yeah, we are um, we are seeing that this type of um, the cross section uh, from this high value, assuming that it it gives you the correct relic abundance, uh, after all these uh, factors, uh, will decrease in four or five orders of magnitude your cross section. Yeah. So yeah, maybe uh, we are in that. And um, so we we may, uh, we are take we are getting some numerical results, but uh, they are not conclusive yet. So I, I didn't want to show you uh, all the all the results, but w that is what we are getting um, in our in our knowledge. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, can I add something, Bastian, please? Uh, sure. The preliminary uh, like, um, numerical results uh, shows that the, the cross sections related to the fluxes for ind indirect detection are mm -hmm. one or two orders of magnitude below the current bounds from uh, CTA or AMS, AMS yeah. depending on the on the final state. Okay, so yeah, it, uh, almost almost uh, sufficient. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They it, they seem to be very close to the upper limits, but um, below, yeah, below the the bounds. That is what you wanted to say? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. Yeah, maybe in some other context in the future, we can find if this is not a, a strong, the signals are not strong enough uh, because you have to deal with LHC bounds and direct detection. Uh, maybe there is uh, another model in which you can fulfill all the all the strong constraints at the same time of uh, obtaining uh, strong fluxes to be tested in uh, at the laboratories.
So I guess we have time for one more question if somebody wants to ask anything. I have more questions, but I don't want to monopolize the discussion. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, I don't see okay, so anybody else, so just go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so for this bounce effect, you didn't have to modify micromegas, right? You just once you have the, the yeah. model implemented, you just put it and, mm. and that's it. Exactly. So, but but that's I mean I, I don't understand I don't understand the, the maybe it's not a question for you, but for the other guys mm. who, who had this paper bouncing dark matter, for me mm. this is the same conversion. This is, or I'm, I'm I'm missing something. I mean, why to make a big deal with this bouncing dark matter? This is pure conversion. You have multi-component dark matter, and one guy can convert to the other, and that's it. Uh, yes, yes, but uh, it was in principle. Um, well, let me try to understand. Uh, or let me uh, see if I interpret uh, your question correctly. You said that when you have only conversions, dark matter conversions, uh, you you can have uh, some bouncing effect, right? Yeah. Um, well, in my understanding, I, I haven't seen uh, a, a bouncing uh, just with with conversions, uh, you have, you have a well conversions, uh, um, semi annihilations if if you prefer. So you can have side side uh, right. into chi h. All so right. So you're basically you're com you're so trading you that... one psi or two psi's into one chi. Yes. Hmm. So okay. no, maybe I I didn't understand your question. So. You said no, for, for, uh, for, for me, this, this is exactly the same multi component dark matter scenario, free, free, freeze out multi component dark matter. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, super interesting, and eh? don't, don't, don't take me wrong. But uh, these guys <laughs> okay. make a paper, I, they, I think they want to make a, a PRL out of the standard multi component freeze out. They, 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 they make this bouncing dark matter. Um, paper, but for me it's the same. I don't see anything new. Maybe I'm missing something. Yeah? Um, the well, in in my understanding, I haven't seen uh, this effect uh, in other multi-component dark matter scenarios yet. Um, you mean there are there are other in in the liter in the literature. You say that uh, you can find some models uh, in the thermal freeze out with two dark matter components in which you find this effect. Yeah, okay, maybe, maybe not this exponential growing. Maybe that's that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I, at, I, at I maybe have in, to read the paper. <laughs> in in my knowledge, I, I hadn't seen. I haven't seen this. Uh, this be strong behavior and and uh, yeah actually they said that they say something that even when the people have seen this uh, effect but not too strong but some bump let's say um they they said or they say that this effect was not related to anything else for instance, to indirect detection, and they in their paper they know that um, you have you can have an uh, uh, an increase uh, an, an enhancement in in your semi annihilation cross section, and with some uh, consequences on in indirect detection, and that is new in my understanding too. So yeah, but. But yeah, as I said, in my knowledge, I hadn't seen this effect um, in almost never, I guess. OK, thanks. Thank you for your questions. 
Yes, so um, thanks a lot again to Bastian. Also, thanks to the people that have asked. I guess one of the uh, main idea of this kind of seminar is to have this kind of uh, discussion. So I think that's a great discussion between Nicolas and Bastian. So thanks again, Bastian.